Well, hello everybody. Thank you for joining this session. Um, my name is Kirsty Grant. Let me just click through. So today we're going to be talking about moving from a reactive to a proactive response to emergency situations using um, situational intelligence. So what I'm going to cover today really are a few areas. Um, we're going to look at the importance of having situational intelligence during a, a large-scale critical event. Um, we're going to look at the challenges of uh, how things are today, a sort of a traditional approach to emergency response um, without um, on-the-ground uh, dynamic real-time intelligence. And then I'll share a couple of solutions that Everbridge has um, where we're innovating in this area and some examples where they're being currently deployed. Um, I should have a, a bit of time for questions, but if we don't, then please come and visit us on stand 37. I think we are just over in the hall there. We'd be very happy to talk to you. So I want to start by talking about why situational intelligence is important. So with any large-scale major incident, uh, typically a number of things will happen. There'll be a lot of calls coming in to your 112 or equivalent system from the public who are experiencing the, uh, the, the initial event. And then from an operational perspective, the emergency centres will start to um, enact plans around two key areas. The first one being to issue a response to that incident, to start putting in place emergency operation procedures, to mobilise first responders, etc. The second thing is to alert the public, so warn and inform. And a lot of the sessions here at ENA talk about public warning systems. It's a topic that we've had here for a number of years. And obviously in the European Union, there's now um, the directive for public warning to be something that all countries, member states have. And so you would want to be giving the public some information about what's happened and some instructions about what to do to stay safe. So the way things are today, typically, is that the response and those two steps of uh, warning and informing and issuing an emergency response are largely reactive. And they are reactive based on the information that you have. The challenge that, that you have today, in many cases, is that information has, uh, has limited um, uh, effectiveness. There's great systems in place in, in many of our city centres, but often we're lacking that real insight into what's happening in the moment, on the ground, to um, give you informed decision-making capability. The other challenge that, that we have is that because of that, you are relying on limited information. You're making assumptions, you're, you're planning, you're putting your, your plans into effect that you may have re rehearsed for similar types of scenarios. But this can take time whilst you uh, evaluate, while you um, bring into the, the discussion all of the information that you're gathering from what's happening out there. So the longer you delay, um, obviously, the outcome of any form of delay during a major crisis is uh, potential for more damage uh, occurring and obviously more casualties as well, unfortunately, the longer the, the, the delay goes on. So not meant as a criticism by any means, but I think you know, we all understand that times in the moment when, when minutes matter, uh, the faster you can respond with good intelligent decision making is, is obviously for the good. So for in order to us uh, to move from being sort of less reactive and more proactive in these situations, what we need is a solution like the one that we have here in Everbridge that gives you really deep um, information into what's happening in real time at the scene of the incident. So I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about what this solution is from Everbridge. Um, I'm going to illustrate it with a very simple example. There's obviously a lot of other things that go on um, during an emergency response, but just to give you a flavour of, of what, we're, what we're talking about. The second solution I'll cover in a little bit is uh, on the operational response side. So this is how you mobilise your first responders. But first of all, I want to talk about where does the situational intelligence come from um, and how it, how it might work in, in a scenario. So what I've done is I've, I've, I've chosen Norway. Norway actually use our systems, but just because it's a place that everyone's familiar with, um, just to illustrate what, what typically could happen. So let's say that there has been some kind of a situation has happened in Oslo uh, on a large scale. There is potential for casualties. There's disruption. We need to respond and we need to make sure that we're keeping people safe. 
the first thing that you probably want to think about is how many people might be in that area where that has happened? What is the potential impact for casualties, for loss of life? But where exactly are they? Um, what, what do we want to do about this? You know, how many ambulances? How many police? How many hospitals might we need to put on high alert? How many roads might we need to close? Do we need to evacuate? And finally, on the public warning side, assuming that you have a system in place, what do we tell people about what has happened? Uh, because clearly, the more information you can get out to people, the, the more chance you have of reducing the damage um, uh, and casualties. So, as I said at the start, we have a certain amount of information from systems that are coming in, from colleagues on the ground, from other uh, sources. But what would be really, really powerful is actually to see real numbers in real time. So what this is, is a, an actual extract from our system. This is Oslo. This is live, not live data, but it's a snapshot of data. Um, and what this shows you is from the cell tower technology, how many mobile devices are connected to those cell towers in that area. So we've defined a kind of a polygon shape around Oslo. And all of these little um, circles with numbers in are actual numbers of devices. So very easily and very quickly, and this is literally seconds, you can come and see the system working on our stand. You can see how many people as a total number are in that area potentially before you even begin to think about what to do. Crucially as well, you can see which nationalities they've come from. Uh, Oslo is an international city. It has tourism, it has business, obviously lots of people living there from overseas as well. So we can also see where those SIM cards are registered, which countries. And that's important because if you're issuing alert messages, you want to be sure that people are getting those instructions in their own language. So you have the ability to then craft a message in their, in their own language. So we, we've answered the question of how many people are in the area right now, but that's not enough, right? So as we go through the incident, as we're in the minutes of planning our response, we want to think about some other things. What, what is happening with the people that are in that area? They're not all going to be stood still. Some will be panicking. Some will be running. Some will be unaware. Some will be in businesses, in meetings. Some will be traveling towards the area. So what is actually happening to the, the, the crowds, the, the movement. So we have this heat mapping technology, and you can see I've gone in a little bit deeper to, to show you how you get more granular information about how many people are in that particular area. So as I say, are people moving towards or moving away? And you can, you can refresh these polygons regularly over time to just see what's happening to get, give you some in, information on the ground. So from that, you can then think about what sort of response do we want to create? Do we want to tell people to stay where they are? Do we need them to move somewhere else? Um, which roads do we want to close, perhaps? You know, where is the nearest hospital as well? So things like this. So going down to the next level, we think we probably should evacuate people. This is a serious enough event that we need to get the, the city centre empty. So the, the, um, the actual incident is happening I don't know if you can see there, a place called Vika in Oslo. Do we have any Norwegians in the room? Okay, so I hope I pronounced that properly. So uh, what this allows you to do very clearly is say, well, okay, within that area of the Slots Park, and there is very few people there. It's a nice big open green space. So wouldn't that be a great place to send people? It's, a, it's also a well-known location in the city. So it's giving you a, a sort of a, a visualization to help you build your evacuation plan and then... Um, carry on with the, the process. And then again, you, you've got to give people instruction to tell them to evacuate and, and where to go to. So this is not obviously a crafted message. I've, I haven't done that. But you get a sense of what that message might need to say. So there's been a major incident in the area of Vika. So avoid the area and evacuate towards uh, the open park area. Um, so you would use multi-channel. Obviously, we're not here to talk about the different ways of, of sending alerts. But as I said before, knowing the nationalities of the people that are in that area is important. So you can send their messages in local language. And we can see in this example that obviously in Norwegian, no surprise, but the second language, English, and then beyond that, Swedish and Polish. So actually, we could do US American, but I don't want to upset any Americans that might be in the room. So English would be OK. Um, so, you know, you can very quickly see that there are some valuable insights and real intelligence in real time that will give command and control some valuable information from which to base their decisions. But that's not enough as well. So let's assume that the evacuation has happened, some time has passed. 
you might want to go back and have another look and, and just check, has everybody left the area? Because is our plan working? How do we know? Uh, there could be people in buildings. There could be people who, who have just not heard what's going on. And you can't leave anyone behind. This, you know, authorities have a duty of care to make sure that everybody is safe. So what our system then can do is, is again, same polygon, same area, report back on how many cell phones might be connected after the evacuation order. And as we can see in this example, yes, there are 38 people um, left connected to the system, mobile phones. Now, it could be the phones have been left on the desk, that's fine, but do you want to take the risk? So maybe we send some response teams to go and investigate and make sure that everybody is, is safe um, and out of the area. So we're sort of taking that intelligence through the life cycle of a major incident and showing how that information can help inform decision making and the, ki the kind of uh, operational plan that you might um, deploy. So in summary about this particular solution, we call it PS Insights, it's Public Safety Insights. So it's something that is available within the public safety technology that we provide as Everbridge, but actually it's something that you could implement in your own countries as a standalone solution. Um, it doesn't need to be um, used, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll, I've jumped ahead. So it can be used also as the dissemination tool if that's how you want to uh, make use of the technology, but you, you don't have to. So you could use this purely to understand what's happening on the ground without using it for the alert, uh, but it can be used. Crucially as well, you don't have to be on an Everbridge system to use this either. So you know, this is a very open architecture. You, we can work with any of the existing public warning systems that are available in the market today being used. Um, and we can obviously, we've shown a little bit about creating zones, but we can create these incident uh, zones and automated notifications so that people who may be approaching that area who weren't in the incident zone, who weren't impacted in the first hours, but might still be moving towards, you can then you know, ensure that those people are alerted. And we've talked about the nationality. The final thing I just wanted to mention about the solution, because this always comes up when we talk about alerting and public communication, it doesn't collect any personal identifiable information. So it's fully GDPR compliant and any other privacy regulations that, that might exist in the countries where we're talking about using this. So that's the first piece of the, the, the presentation that I want to talk about. Um, the second half is really how situational intelligence would then help in command and control to effect an effective response. Um, and we have a solution uh, called Saga, which is a computer-aided dispatch system for emergency and incident management. So again, let's think about this scenario. We've had the incident in Oslo. Um, the 112 calls are coming in. There's, there's a lot of activity. So obviously, that's a key part of your response. Um, but again, knowing how many people are in this area that's been impacted will help you plan how you deploy your first responders. What kind of um, uh, you know, vehicles are needed? Is it fire trucks? Is it ambulances? How many police? Do we need to alert the local hospitals? Do they need to be put on standby? Do we need to create um, you know, this, this kind of uh, uh, organization of multi-agency support? based on the numbers of people that may be needed um, to be rescued. The second part of that, of course, is if we know that we need more than 10 ambulances, do we have enough within our capability, within our resources, to dispatch them? Where are they? Who are the nearest? Or do we need to go outside of our own 112 and ask for help and resources from other neighbouring towns or, or regions. So that's a very simple illustration. Um, but just briefly on the actual systems itself. So the Saga system that we have, it gives you the opportunity to obviously clearly see what's happening from the situation intelligence piece in Everbridge, but also to track all of the resources that are within the dispatch team. So police, vehicles, ambulance, uh, fire, even search and rescue um, in relation to the incident itself. So in a very sort of clear and dynamic tool that we have, very welcome to come and see it on the stand. We're showing how that works. 
And I say, because you have that, that mapping capability, you can see in relation to the incident, where are the nearest vehicles and send those to the, the, as the first responders uh, for the quickest response to the incident itself. And it also allows for this collaboration, as I mentioned, multi-agency collaboration, but collaboration from the command centre out to the operators in the field, the units that have gone to scene uh, throughout the incident. So it's a really comprehensive solution. Um, Everbridge is quite well known for public warning. We're not so well known for this. So please do come and, and see more about, about this solution. So I'm just going to finish up on a couple of real world examples to illustrate how this technology is being used today. Um, it's not that new, but it is, it is new to a lot of, of countries and organizations. The first one I'm, I'm going to talk about is actually in Europe. So interestingly, uh, the Gendarmerie Nationale in France is the largest global implementation of uh, a command and control system using the Saga solution. And not just mainland France, but all of the French territories as well globally. So you can see the stats on the screen up here. There's up to 80,000 mobile devices on the system. Um, and it has the capability to, to have 4,000 concurrent users today with a maximum of 10,000. So it's very large scale and it's being used today. It's, it's been used as a web client since 2020. And there are some plans to, to do more with that. And the last one is Iceland, somewhere I still haven't been, but I would love to go. But interestingly, Iceland is, is unique. Um, it was described by uh, one of the 112 officers there as a rock in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean where everything's trying to kill you, uh, which I think is quite a nice description. Um, quite a small population for a European country, but a huge number of tourists coming in. So clearly the ability to know the language, the nationality of people who are visiting, to send them alerts in a region where everything is dangerous is really, really important. So I just want to show a couple of, of comments that were made about the use of the system um, by the 112 teams. And, and what they were saying was that knowing exactly how many people, so exactly how many people there are in an area can help us better understand how serious the situation is, and prepare for the next steps in our rescue efforts. So that's not us saying it, that's them saying it. And they use this all the time. And secondly, they use it to, to prepare and plan and, and sort of mitigate some of the damage that might happen by, by getting in front of the situation. So if they think that something might be happening, there are volcanoes, there are maybe potentials for flooding, there are potentials for really bad storms, um, I think the whole world came to an end, didn't it, in 2010 when the, when the earthquake, sorry, the volcano went up. They use this system to, to forewarn people and to give a, a bit of preparation time on, on what might be happening. So that's, uh, that's the technology solutions that we wanted to talk about today. And as I say, please come and talk to us. And I'll just finish on why us, who are we? Some of you may not know who we are. We've, we've turned blue in the last few months. So if, if you expected to see Everbridge in orange and red, we, we're blue. Um, so very happy to, to be in blue now. Um, but we have a platform for public safety. Uh, it's not just public warning, it's not just the CAD that we've talked about, but our solutions help you in that whole life cycle of being prepared, knowing what's coming, to the uh, reaction phase, the respond phase, and also the reaching everybody and, and leaving no one behind through, through the communication. And who do we do it for? We do it for a lot of countries, and we do it for a lot of government organizations in public safety, some at country level, some at continental level, in the case of Australia, um, but also down in the 112 areas as well. So uh, we're in more than 25 countries. We've got more, but we, we're not announcing them just yet, but we will be. Um, so yeah, we, we have a lot of happy and successful implementations all over the world. Um, with good, good sort of stories to tell about how they're using our solution. So on that, I think I have one minute if anyone does have any questions. Otherwise, I'll hand over to the next presenter. Any questions? Nope. Oh, okay. Oh, one. Yes. Does your monitoring also cover demonstrations and protests? Yes. Yes. Yes, exactly. I mean, I, I chose a, a sort of anonymous example, but exactly, it could be anything. Um, typically, you would want to be using it uh, when there's large numbers of people assembling, because that's where you get the value. So absolutely, 
because it's it's doing it's doing that. It's just it's showing you who's in the area. So from a civil unrest perspective, you could you could certainly use it for that, and then send alerts to to ask people to disperse or to move to a different area. Um, and as you say, the monitoring of is that crowd growing? Is it becoming unsafe? Um, or is it dispersing? In which case, we don't need to do anything. But yeah, good point. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's pretty obvious from my accent that I'm from the States, so don't hold that against me. Um, I'm actually really excited to be here. Uh, I've been getting to know our uh, European team. Uh, it's really nice to be able to meet people in person, shake their hands, look in their eyes, and uh, have more of a connection than what we had for many years with COVID, of not being able to travel. Um, so it's a great opportunity for that. Um, I have uh, uh, a lot of integrations that we do in the States with software and um, over the past six to 12 months, it's been a lot more talking about how do we integrate with our European solutions and what are our, what, for me, it's learning what our solutions are and meeting with the product teams, getting to know them. So um, this talk today is, uh, is focused on the AI side of things. So I run an AI services team, and we integrate with a lot of different products in the Motorola suite. Um, let's see, clicker? All right. So what I'm really focused on is our Command Central suite. So Command Central is all about the cloud. Um, so in traditional 911 systems, uh, they're on-prem or on-premise installations. And uh, with Command Central, we've been moving a lot of our solutions into the cloud. And in the cloud, for, um, for uh, um, AI, it opens up a lot of possibilities. So, um, when you start looking at the cloud, some of the reasons why we've been moving there are the um, much larger storage capabilities, uh, the able to access the data anywhere. Um, there's uh, the not having to install software on premise, having 24 seven support for that, dealing with the, hard, the hardware itself, hardware failures, redundancies, all of that's in the, um, in the cloud is just much easier. Um, with the cloud, it's easier to do 365 by 7 by 24 support as well. Um, we have a security team that is very focused on how to lock down our environments in the cloud. Um, we have very in-depth reviews of every piece of software that goes out, as well as this underlying system that's maintaining it. So in the public space, I know that this is uh, something that people concentrate a lot on. And in um, talking to people about moving from on-prem to the cloud, being able to assure them that it's a highly secure environment is very important. Um, I can't really see you very well, but um, I'm just curious of everybody here, who, who has at least all some or all of your uh, software in the cloud. OK, so some people are still totally on premise, some people in the cloud. All right, um, so the reason why cloud is important for me personally is that uh, it allows um, capabilities for artificial intelligence to run in a much more um, hardware intense environment. So instead of having to install a huge suite of GPUs, which are very expensive on-premise, you have a cloud solution where people are sharing, um, well, 
the product is using GPUs that are shared across customers. And it can scale up and down depending on need. Um, so uh, the um, command central suite uh, that we focus on, we talk about life cycles. Um, when we're talking about two or one one two, sorry, I keep having to try to replace in my head nine one one with one one two. <laughs> so in one one two situations, um, you have a, a portion of your life cycle that I've laid out is um, citizen, the one one two call taker, the um, dispatcher, and the supervisor. So these are the main um, people involved in a real-time call situation. And then after call, you have um, the call taker and the supervisor that will often be looking at what happened during the call. So this is the part of the incident life cycle that I'm focused on today. All right, so um, I can't see the screen very well, so I'm just going to be looking behind me. <laughs> All right, so AI. So how can we make the 112 one, um, incident lifecycle better? With transcription, um, you have a, a live scrolling transcription of the call. And the call taker can look at that. They can see the transcription. Um, and in a call taker situation, if you've ever been in a, a call center for 112 calls, there are a lot of screens. There's a lot of information. These call takers are taking call after call with sometimes very little to no breaks in between the calls. They're talking to people who are in very high stress situations, and that puts stress on the call taker. So um, to help simplify and not have them reading through the entire transcription, we can do things like highlighting parts of the um, transcript that's coming through. A big one is keywords. Uh, so um, being able to automatically detect and um, with AI come up with highlighted keywords within the transcription helps them to focus on the most important part of the calls. Did that person just say gun? Did that person just say something about a shooting? Like, you know, when you've got the um, person calling in, um, uh, sometimes they're speaking very rapidly. Um, instead of the call taker having to ask them a question to clarify what they just said, they can quickly look over at the transcript and see. And with the keywords, they can quickly zero in on the part of what the caller just said that is important to them in the moment. Um, summarization is uh, um, something that we can do um, uh, a few minutes into the call we are looking at um, when we have enough of a transcript to summarize it, um, being able to, in real time, do a summary. Uh, that is more useful for the supervisor to do, um, instead of having to do real time playback or be watching the face of the call taker to see if anybody's in stress or to have to read the entire transcription if they could see uh, an in real time summary of what's going on in a call. If they can see the keywords, it helps them zero in on um, maybe a call that they want to jump into and listen to. Um, with the address and phone number, so in, um, in our systems, uh, Rapid, um, Rapid SOS is here. And I'm not sure if you've seen a presentation or stopped by their booth, um, but they have uh, the ability to pull the address location off of the cell phone, like from Google or um, the um, software that's actually on the phone figuring out what the address is, which is much more accurate than triangulation. So um, um, as we um, pull in perhaps an address from SOS that is where the actual caller is, maybe you also want to know what address the, call the caller is talking about. So they might be looking um, kitty corner across the street and talking about a crash or talking about an incident that they don't want to be right next to. And so they're talking about a different address than where their cell phone is actually located. So we want to know um, with Rapid OSOS, right? We want to know where the caller is, but we also want to know if they're talking about an address that is different from where they're at. 
Another very common one is um, uh, where they're um, where they're calling about a loved one, um, a, a wellness check, where they want to have somebody go to their mother's house um, to check because they're worried about the health of their mother. The mother isn't answering the phone, different things like that. So um, that's where their spoken address is going to be different from where they're located. Um, so um, along with um, being able to uh, pull out, hey, this is an address, highlight it. Hey, they just said a phone number, highlight it. With the address, um, we're actually uh, implementing some new technology to be able to use AI to, deter to determine this is an address, and then make a call to Esri, get the geolocation, and pull it back um, into the call as metadata on the call. For us, uh, there's the call taker's location, and then we're calling it the spoken address um, if it shows up in transcription. So um, some things that we do that aren't just out-of-box transcription is the ability to take call data and take a model that's been trained for speech-to-text and train it for the unique situation of a call center. So I've talked about um, in the call center, you can have many call takers. You can have call takers that are under a lot of stress. Um, you can have uh, the callers calling in on a cell phone. Maybe their signal isn't strong. Maybe there are a lot of noises in the background. A very common sound is the sound of an emergency vehicle approaching, right? So. Um, by taking all this data of calls um, that have come in, we retrain base speech-to-text models to be able to handle um, the unique environment of a call center to make the transcription uh, higher accuracy. Um, um, once you have these different capabilities that you're getting, um, these AI capabilities, uh, um, when you're summarizing a call, it also, um, uh, that can be used to intelligently figure out, hey, what is the CAD incident type for the call? So again, um, our motto, which I didn't point out. Um, oops, wrong way, sorry. Uh, this is every second counts. Whenever there's a conversation about a new feature, about any kind of change to the system, it's all about performance. Are we decreasing the time to be able to bring information to the call taker? Um, are we working within certain boundaries? Um, in the US, there's been a lot of studies about if um, the, how important the first seven seconds are of a call and how important it is to get that dispatcher out and on the way to the person. And that literally, by saving seconds of getting a, uh, getting somebody dispatched, it is saving a life. All right. Uh, so um, this is the next phase in our customer lifecycle: um, is uh, the the supervisor role, and then the after, uh, as well as post call. So a uh, supervisor in a call center, I touched on how they could be. Um, reviewing calls, and um, when we're looking at being able to automatically create keywords, uh, there's this idea of um, what if the uh, supervisor could see the clouds, uh, sorry, could see the calls in, um, grouped by keywords. Um, uh, an interesting situation is uh, perhaps there is a uh, shooting happening. And in shootings, you typically have a lot of calls coming in. And if a supervisor were, um, was able to see the keywords and calls coming in and group the calls by these keywords, they could say, show me all the calls where a shooting is happening right now. And instantly they're seeing, um, here are these eight calls that are live right now with somebody who said the word shoot or shooting or gun. Uh, Post-call, uh, all the calls are saved. Um, when you have a transcription associated with audio, 
you have the ability to search the text of the transcription. This gives you a lot of rich data that is not necessarily um, being captured anywhere else. Uh, so it allows for uh, much enhanced um, capabilities in searching and finding what you're looking for. The supervisor and the call taker, um, often after calls, they're looking at how a call went, what happened in it. And with the transcription, you can pull up the audio, pull up um, the transcription, and use the transcription to find the areas of the call that you want to focus on. Uh, so I've talked about keywords. Uh, real world use of this would be um, uh, president coming to down. It's, it's uh, not as um, uh, kind of a high of adrenaline keyword as shooting, but this is a case where um, even uh, um, shooting might be on your list of keywords that you want to be aware of, but um, president might be coming up a lot. And so being able to do a search on the full transcript for any word that you want to search on that may not be in your keyword list, it allows for that real-time searching uh, and real-time research. All right, so these are some mock-ups of UI of um, how some of these capabilities could look in uh, products. So um, over here, we have our uh, uh, command central CRS uh, product that is sold here and in Europe. And um, you can see, you know, there's a lot going on during call. Um, and uh, um, this particular in, uh, screenshot is of instant playback. So this is uh, during a live call, a supervisor being able to go in, select a call that's happening, and listen to the audio um, that, uh, from, from the call. Um, so on the, um, on the southern, uh, uh, so uh, there's the circle there of where the incident playback is. The, you can see the audio. Um, they have ability to rewind, re-listen to a part of it. And in the situation, again, you just have the audio track. If you had the live transcription playing next to the audio track, you can then use the um, transcription where you could search the transcription text itself to jump to the part of the call that you're interested in. Um, there will also be all of the highlights <coughs> that I was talking about, the address, the phone number, keywords, will all be highlighted in the transcription to be able to quickly access the part of the audio that the supervisor is interested in listening to. Um, so uh, this view is what it's like for the call taker. They've got the CAD system up. They're trying to enter a new incident while they're on the call with the customer. Um, and over on this side, it shows how um, you have uh, a lot of different channels that could be incoming. Uh, uh, sorry, a lot of different, <laughs> um, uh, uh, a lot of different incoming channels, but there's one conversation that's happening. So uh, a common occurrence, uh, let's say somebody calls in and they're speaking a language that the call taker doesn't understand. They need to conference in a translator. And so now you have multiple audio sources coming in um, to the, the same call. So um, the transcription is transcribing everything. It's transcribing everything that the call taker is saying, and it's transcribing um, any source of audio um, on the caller side of things. So um, being able to see the, um, what the caller is saying, what the um, translator is saying, and then we're also working on the ability to translate in real time to the language of the, of the call taker. So um, uh, the scenario of why we're doing this is, so um, let's say we're in the UK, um, the call taker is, uh, they only know English, but they have somebody call in that is speaking French. And so they have to get a translator on the line to be able to translate French. But um, 
maybe the translator didn't quite understand what the call taker's question was, um, the call taker can see a real-time translation of what the translator is asking, and they can make a correction or a, a qualification um, for the translator to retranslate, to restate what the question is to the, um, to the caller. So um, this is especially critical when um, maybe somebody is having a stroke and, they're, and the call taker is asking questions to try to clarify what the symptoms are. If that isn't um, precisely translated by the translator, that is that could be a life or death situation. Um, all right, uh, this is again um, a post call or during a call. The ability for um, adding in some capabilities into the search experience to make it more effective. Um, so uh, the top is your typical full text search of any metadata about a call. Much of this is entered by, um, much if not all of it is entered by the call taker. Um, the call takers probably don't have a lot of time to do a summarization of the call. So in AI, when you're getting a summarization of the call, this is a great place that helps enhance the search experience for um, a supervisor trying to search or when an incident is going on. Um, I spoke about the shooting incident. If you can see all of the calls that are happening or post-call, you want to see how well did we handle this incident. Um, being able to see the summarization, be able to search for it, and um, when the results are returned, being able to quickly read what the summarization of the call, you're clicking into each call less, and this screen becomes much more useful. So to summarize the value um, that transcription is adding in these real-world life-or-death situations, um, we have uh, saving time and increasing efficiency. I've touched on this, and I want to bring it back to every second counts. The decrease the load on call takers. Uh, you can go to our booth. It's really cool. We've got all these screens set up. It's, um, it, it really shows the cognitive load that a call taker is under. And anything we can do to reduce that cognitive load is a huge win in this situation. The supervisors enhancing their ability to monitor calls, to step in when needed, to realize that, oh, I've got a call, I've got a call taker who is like maxed out, like they need to take a break. Right? It, it helps them know when to step in and, and force that call taker to take a walk. You know, um, uh, Acts as a training tool. This is post-call. Um, again, it's a great way to search and find the calls that you want to review, that you may want to pull the call takers in and talk about. All right, and I believe I, I believe we have a, a couple minutes for questions, maybe. Um, but we do have a booth up on the first floor right next to the coffee shop, so you can grab a coffee and come say hi. Uh, we have a lot of really knowledgeable people that have come to this conference that are very passionate about the products they work on and sell. Um, uh, and um, some people that I've been talking to today, it's really exciting, the future they see and the capabilities they want to bring into the products that are AI-based. So please come talk to us. Uh, any questions before I end? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so you talked about the keywords. Is it possible so that if a special keyword gets mentioned during the call that it automatically flashes on the supervisor screen, or does he have to look for it? Yeah, so, um, so in Vesta 911 in the US, we currently have a call word feature that is based on a list of keywords from, um, from each individual customer. And they um, can rate keywords as uh, um, red, yellow, green. And the red ones are a cue to them that these are their hot keywords that they really want to pay attention to. Anything else? All right, well, thank you for your time and attention today, and please come see us.